Okay, thank you, uh, Patrick. Um, so, um, a quick uh, background. I am uh, the founder and chief technology officer of Imatest. Our main products are software and test charts for uh, measuring image quality in digital cameras. And um, a lot of what's happening here is of great interest, and we hope that we can continue to develop products that are predictive of performance of cameras in uh, automotive or other systems where lighting is uh, very difficult and uh, challenging. Um, I'm going to be covering essentially three topics in this talk, so uh, it will be a little bit uh, scattered. Uh, the first topic uh, relates uh, uh, fairly closely with what Dr. Giese uh, uh, spoke about earlier and also is uh, kind of inspired by Ulrich Sager, uh, his talk uh, last September at AutoSense. Um, and it has to do with the visibility of low contrast features in dark areas of contrasty images, difficult situations. And we've developed a new test chart uh, to attempt to deal with that. So I'll be talking about the background and then the new chart, which we will be presenting to the Standards Committee. Then I go to a different topic, which is how we deal with ultra-wide angle camera measurements. I think we have some very nice solutions. And finally, we get to the area that um, uh, our solutions are imperfect, which is the ISO 16505 standard for uh, camera monitor systems for mirror replacement. That standard has a number of difficulties which have caused pain to customers, and we still don't have good connection with a standards group. It definitely needs to be fixed. But I'll talk about what we're doing with it and what our issues are. So let's get going on the first part. Um, if you're interested in the visibility of objects, uh, low contrast objects, you know, in uh, over a range of fields, uh, one of the key limiting factors is flare light, um, which is light that is basically stray light inside the camera. It's bouncing between the camera uh, lens elements and off the barrel of the lens. And it's actually a rather complex phenomenon that includes ghost imaging. Um, we basically model it very simply. So the veiling glare measurement tends to measure susceptibility to flare light, which can be complex. The veiling glare measurement does not include um, things like ghost imaging, which are pretty important. Essentially, um, what you see here is uh, the ISO 18844 uh, chart, which is a white field with a number of uh, holes in it, uh, behind which is kind of a dark cavity that essentially doesn't reflect light back, so they could be called light traps or black holes. Uh, when you have flare light in the system, the image in the camera is not completely black, it goes dark gray. And this phenomenon definitely limits the effective practical dynamic range of a camera and the ability to distinguish low contrast objects. So um, this shows the um, typical uh, ISO um, chart, which we do support. And when you um, compensate for black level offset and make sure the image is linear, then the veiling glare is just the dark level divided by the white level, extremely simple. Um, it's an easy enough uh, measurement to make. The problem with this measurement is it really doesn't give you a good indication of how much degradation there is in the image, of what really happens to low contrast features. It's just a number, and for practical reasons, it may overstate the effects of flare. So it's a number that you have to do something with in order to uh, use in some way. Um, so we support it, but it's not our favorite. Um, we also do a lot of work with standard grayscale test charts. Uh, this is one of our charts. It has a, a tonal range of about 120 dB, which is um, not as good as the best HDR sensors, but probably better than you can get in any practical camera. Uh, there are a number of similar charts. It's a transmissive chart. Uh, the bottom half is uh, made with two layers of uh, photographic film. Uh, you can't do this with one layer of film. 
And we do get um, fairly decent measurements of uh, dynamic range with this chart. It has to be used in um, a very uh, carefully controlled environment. It has to be absolutely darkened room with you know, black uh, features around it, curtains or whatever, because you want to minimize the light that reflects back to the chart. So a lot of the um, uh, measurements that we're going to show are done with an EOS 6D, uh, you know, high quality digital SLR, good macro lens, uh, raw file, low ISO speed, but no noise reduction. So we use that for the examples here. Um, oh, all right, that's better. Oh, I see what's happened. I have to be very careful where I put my big thumbs. Um, this is a typical result from um, <clears throat> this uh, high dynamic range chart. Now, I believe the curve on the top may have been affected a little bit by light reflecting back to the chart. Uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, we're going to be improving our test setup. Uh, down below, we have a measurement of dynamic range based on quality level. It's a fairly useful measurement, um, but it doesn't directly tell you what is the visibility of low contrast objects. And there is uh, one weakness for any type of grayscale chart. And that weakness is when you do tone mapping, uh, the results don't make any sense at all. Now, tone mapping involves bringing up the average level of darker patches. Essentially, you divide the image into tiles or you strongly low-pass filter it, blur it very heavily, and then you apply that image in such a way that you're bringing up the, the darker patches. Well, when you do that with a standard a grayscale chart, uh, you get a very low contrast, and essentially uh, the curve on the lower right there doesn't mean much and doesn't tell you very much. So um, to deal with this issue, you know, how to observe low contrast features uh, in a variety of brightnesses in an image, we developed a new test chart that we call the contrast resolution chart. And... Um, Essentially, it consists of 20 large patches with density steps of 0.25 OD, optical density, which is equivalent to five decibels. It has a total dynamic range of 95 dB, which I have to uh, explain a little bit because the very best uh, new HDR sensors go up to 150 dB. But as soon as you put glass in front of the sensor, uh, you're back down probably to somewhere around or probably under 100 dB. Uh, the real world is a little bit tough, and the sensors are fantastic, but uh, once the lenses go on, uh, well, you're back in the real world. Um, now, the key feature of the chart is each of the 20 patches contains a light gray and a dark gray small patch within it. These patches have a 2 to 1 brightness ratio, so it's 0.3 optical density or 6 dB difference. And the key thing that we do here uh, is in measuring signal to noise ratio, normally you would measure the noise in the gray area, which is larger, gives you better noise statistics, and then use the mean level of the gray area for the signal, for signal to noise ratio. For this measurement, for the contrast uh, sensitivity, we look at the difference between the light and dark, and we call that the signal, and use that uh, to define the signal-to-noise ratio. <clears throat> so here is a picture of some of the things that we do with this chart when we analyze it. Since we know the locations of all the regions, one thing we do to enable us to see what's going on <clears throat> is to lighten each region, or essentially make each region have the same brightness. And we do that by transforming the RGB image into XYY, where the big Y is luminance, adjusting the Y and then transferring it, transforming it back to uh, RGB. And when we do that, we can see very clearly the patches near the top. Maybe the first patch is a little low contrast because it's near saturation. And then as you get down to the bottom, you can really see the noise. It looks probably worse than I would have expected, but you're really boosting up nearly nothing uh, to uh, 
a fairly light gray level, and you can see gradually the image disappearing. We can do a number of measurements from this chart, from the original, not from the lightened image. So we can look at the signal um, of the light minus dark patches. It's the upper, um, the upper magenta curve is, is a light minus dark patch signal. We can also look at it unnormalized. The upper one is normalized to the gray level. The lower one is unnormalized. We actually find this is not uh, the best measurement. What we have found, uh, and I'll show you in a little more detail, uh, the most useful measurement uh, from this chart is the signal to noise ratio based on the light minus dark gray difference. And that is the lower right magenta line. It, it seems to be quite sensitive. Um, oops. Uh, we have a, a little bit more detail here. In each of the patches on the equal level um, uh, display, uh, what we have, I don't know if this has a, does this have a laser built into it? Let me see. I'm going to risk pushing a button. Oops. Oh, no. Wrong button. Okay. See if we can get back. That was not the right button to push. Oh, all right. Yeah, here we are. The laser pointer is that one. Right? Oh, over here. Okay. It's invisible in uh, dim light. Okay, so uh, we have a number of uh, items that display um, in each patch. Basically, you have a signal, uh, and this, this signal is. Um, It's the, the gray level signal, that's right, we're looking at uh, these patches, the gray level signal. Uh, this is the light uh, minus dark signal normalized uh, to the gray level. This is just the patch number. This indicates that we have signal to noise ratio below. This is the traditional uh, uh, gray level uh, signal to noise ratio. And this is the number based on the difference. This is the number we find is the most useful. So 2.42 signal to noise ratio, you have reasonably good appearance of the light minus dark. At 1.29, you can see it, but you know it's there mainly because you know what to expect from all the other patches. When it goes under one, uh, it's, it's pretty hopeless. Uh, it's really quite useless, unless you absolutely know what's there. Um, and uh, we find that this number is a most interesting number, and we can do some very good things with it. And one of the things uh, that we can do is define a dynamic range, which is over here, based on the light minus dark signal to noise ratio, or perhaps we can call it the contrast resolution, SNR, greater than a specified amount which would be somewhere in the range of 6 to 14 dB. 6 dB is 2 to 1, 14 dB is 5 to 1, which does appear in uh, some literature that uh, we refer to. Um, and uh, this, uh, uh, what should I say, depending on your application, you might choose a different uh, signal to noise ratios for your dynamic range. So for example, if you are interested in observing very low contrast, lower than two to one objects, you would have to increase the uh, SNR in defining the dynamic range using this chart. But what we hope is that this chart is predictive of a fairly wide range of situations and that does produce a useful number um, one of the goals is we know that the real world is a pretty tough and uncontrolled place. Uh, we are trying to make test charts that are quite predictive of performance, and I suspect this is not uh, the last one. We will be very interested in feedback uh, about this chart. Um, so uh, here I basically i am looking at a tone mapped image, and uh, the, the key takeaway from this plot is that the uh, light minus dark gray signal to noise ratio for tone mapped images is very similar uh, to the response to regular images. This uh, 
Uh, it's a pretty ugly tone mapped image using this default MATLAB uh, tone map routine. But um, uh, the good thing is this measurement works for tone mapping and actually will enable you to look at the effectiveness and, and quality of uh, tone mapping results. Um, okay, summary, we've developed a new test chart that enables you to directly observe the visibility of low contrast objects in larger fields over a very wide tonal range. We found that the SNR measurements based on the difference between light and dark are meaningful and significant. And, um, and that correlates very well with what we see. Um, we also have proposed a new measure of dynamic range based on the contrast resolution um, being greater than a, a certain amount, or the signal to noise ratio for contrast resolution. Um, we can define the exact dynamic range based on a minimum uh, SNR based on the application. You know, so the, the higher the contrast that you need to, to uh, uh, observe, the lower uh, uh, the dynamic, or actually the higher the contrast, the higher dynamic range would be. Uh, finally, we do note that the dynamic range is going to be very much less than the HDR sensors that are available now. Um, this system, which is a good digital SLR, seems to have a dynamic range of about 65 dB, which is equivalent to about 11 f-stops. Um, so that's it for uh, this contrast resolution. This is available in a uh, alpha version uh, of the Imitest program that's under development. You can write us uh, if you want that latest version. The chart is available and in production. Um, Second topic I'm going to discuss, this will be a bit shorter, is ultra-wide angle camera measurements. It seems to come up a lot in automotive imaging. Um, the key thing um, is that um, we, we use slanted edges. Uh, we have this target that we call the uh, SFR reg. It's a uh, registration mark or fiducial mark target that is automatically detected and be, can be uh, placed anywhere in the image. Um, one thing we have done, and I think other uh, software vendors have done, is uh, to note that the ISO algorithm for slanted edge measurement assumes a straight line edge, which in fact you don't get at all in um, uh, fisheye, you know, highly distorted wide angle lenses. So what we do is we assume that the edge is a second order fit uh, second order polynomial that we fit, and it works extremely well. We're in fact uh, working on adding this to the ISO standard. Um, but there are a few interesting uh, applications of what we do. We have uh, a chart called the SFR plus chart that is available pre-distorted, uh, so it doesn't have to be exactly the inverse of the distortion of your lens, but even if it's approximate, you get good uh, numbers out of it, and um, you can actually measure the distortion. There's a way of dealing with uh, the known pre-distortion of the chart. Um, this is a sample result of running a pre-distorted chart, and we get a lot of geometrical information as well as sharpness map over the field, chromatic aberration, and so on. Um, more interesting a case that uh, we've been upgrading quite recently is using this um, SFR reg pattern. What we do is we have a pre-distorted chart in the center, and then you can have a number of additional charts at the periphery of the image facing the camera. These could be circular, or depending on the distortion, they might be oval uh, charts. But um, you can actually go out to extreme fields of view, and I believe we've tested these with up to 270 uh, degree field of view cameras. There's some pretty strange ones out there. Um, here is an example of an image made in this way. Um, and what you have here is the center chart, which is not perfectly uh, corrected, but close enough. All of the regions are, distorted, are, are detected. And um, we can actually get a very nice map of the sharpness of the image. We can look at uh, individual edges, and 
This is the average edge in the MTF. Or in this case, uh, this is a, a 3D map of the MTF 50P, the uh, spatial frequency where you're half of the peak value. Uh, what the customer noted is that what's wrong here, uh, he was saying, uh, uh, it seems to be much less sharp on the right than on the left. This isn't correct. Well, turned out uh, it, was, it was very visible in the image. And um, his system was misaligned. He was able to correct the alignment and get much better results. Um, recently, we've upgraded this uh, center chart so that we are automatically detecting color and grayscale patterns uh, within the chart. So we can look at uh, the colors. These are ellipses for delta E 2000. They tell you how uh, far off your color is perceptually. We can also look at tonal response, noise, a lot of different uh, things with this chart. And I think that uh, concludes the part on wide angle uh, solutions. Um, the other uh, part of the talk, and I'm going to be fairly brief here, I've given some rather geeky, uh, uh, overly detailed technical talks, is about the ISO 16505 standard. This is a standard that recently appeared for uh, automotive uh, mirror replacement camera monitor systems. And it's a pretty important standard, and it's caused a lot of pain for uh, anybody trying to use it, uh, because some of the measurements are uh, impractical. Now, if anybody here has worked on this standard, you're welcome to come, and, and please give me a hard time. We, we, we believe the standard needs to be fixed. And, uh, we have not been in contact with the key people. Uh, but I'll t tell you a few things about what we're doing. Uh, key features of the standard are um, it uses high contrast wedges instead of slanted edges, which are called for in ISO 12233 2014 for measuring sharpness. Uh, there are a lot of problems with using wedges, but there are some things you can do to make them better. Also, it uses uh, MTF-10 as a key measurement, and MTF-10 has a lot of difficulties. I'll talk a little bit about them. Sometimes the MTF doesn't even get down to the 10% level. Very often, it's fairly flat around the 10% level, and a small change in the system can make a large change in the measurement. It's a big problem, but there is an answer, a solution to that. Um, there are some references. The Handbook of Camera Monitor Systems is excellent, very detailed. Um, we have written a paper about it. Uh, I'll only cover the highlights here. Um, in the standard, they talk about measuring for sharpness, measuring essentially the uh, modulation uh, of you know, the oscillations here. And they come up with numbers that, to me, seem absolutely arbitrary. This is varying all over the place. Uh, but they decide, well, this is the upper limit, this is the lower limit. I, I, I don't know really uh, how they arrived at those exact numbers. Um, we have proposed a different method. Won't go into detail there, but we basically um, fit the oscillations to Fourier coefficients, and we come up with an amplitude based on the sine and the cosine, square root of sum of squares, and it's, as far as we can tell, a pretty accurate and stable approach uh, to deriving MTF from a wedge. Um, so it's a little bit different. Also, the other approach, um, there's some issues with the fact that the wedge is a square wave, essentially. and um, there's a bit of an error that a square wave introduces as compared to a sine wave, 4 over pi error. But uh, that's all in the papers. I don't think I'll go into the detail here. Uh, one of the issues that uh, we do run into is that when you're using high contrast wedges, which are called for in the standard, this is an excerpt from, a, or a, rather a crop from one of the standard charts based on the old ISO standard, uh, when the contrast is very high, you tend to clip. And when you clip, well, you get a very stable result with wedge measurements. With slanted edges, clipping actually um, uh, 
uh, will cause an improvement in MTF. Actually, you see that here. This is based on a slanted edge. But clipping makes your measurements more stable. One of the problems that the authors had is they found that measurements were not very stable using slanted edges, but I think they might have been seeing something real and important. This on the right is a strongly sharpened, extremely sharpened system. It would have highly visible halos. And uh, uh, you get this big peak in the MTF. You really are very sensitive to signal processing. With the high, frequent, with the high contrast patterns, you're not so sensitive, but it's an error. It's not really giving you a true and accurate result. And this is true of both wedges and slanted edges. We do prefer the, the slanted edge measurement. But it turns out there are some things that can uh, save the wedge measurements. Here, here uh, we're illustrating a problem of uh, a wedge measurement where uh, you have a somewhat noisy system, some artifacts, and it turns out the MTF-10 is never uh, really reached when you look at the MTF curve. It's essentially undefined. Um, the way we get around that is there's something good about wedges. You can count the number of detected wedges. And when that count, you have to smooth it because of noise, drops below about 95% of the low frequency count, you're OK. You've, you've got a limit, and you can say that is the approximate onset of aliasing, at least for a fairly sharp system. And so um, what we, in fact, do is we define an MTF limit as the minimum of the MTF-10, the onset of aliasing where the count drops, and the Nyquist frequency. And this seems to give a reasonably good result, but it's not officially authorized in the 16505 standard. Uh, if we think it should be. There are a lot of other changes we'd like to see in the standard. Um, and I'll go through the summaries a little bit later. A couple of other things I want to mention that we um, um, are doing related to the standard. Because it's a camera monitor system, um, it, to hold, test the entire system, you actually have to photograph the camera. And that would mean photographing it with a well-calibrated, high-quality uh, camera, typically a DSLR or mirrorless camera, with much higher resolution than the monitor itself. Um, this is uh, easy enough to do. Um, one of the issues, though, is what units to use for defining spatial frequencies. Uh, typically, uh, we like to talk about line widths or line pairs per image height. There's a bit of rotation happening here. Um, and if you're doing it with a separate camera, you don't get that number directly. But what you find is that the monitor height within the image is a certain number of pixels. So we now have a new set of units where you can say line widths per n pixels, where n pixels represents the monitor height. Um, and I think it's a very good set of units. And I uh, have brought it up because I found that the units used in ISO 16505 were kind of bewilderingly complex. Uh, I actually still don't understand them very well, but uh, perhaps someone can help with them. But I think these are very effective units for measuring a uh, system. We've also implemented uh, the color error uh, standard in ISO 16505. It's done in UV space, which would not be our favorite. UV space is not very perceptually uniform, but it's good enough, it works. We would have preferred C-Lab AB which is much more uh, perceptually uniform, especially in the angular measurements. Three minutes? Oops, wait a minute, try again. So I'm, I'm almost at the end. Um, I have to go back one. Um, so the quick summary here is um, saturation or clipping um, is a very serious issue in any of the 16505 measurements. That's why a low contrast slanted edges are called for in ISO 12233. And if we do stick with wedges, we would recommend uh, lowering the contrast from basically black and white, which is at least 40 to 1, maybe to 10 to 1. This would just uh, be less error prone. Um, we, although we prefer MTF 50, to MTF-10, at least for uh, visibility and perceptual measurements, uh, we do recommend a 
enhancement of MTF10, where you look at that minimum value of the MTF10, the aliasing where the count drops and the Nyquist frequency. Anyway, that's uh, the quick summary. Um, we are particularly interested in measuring low contrast objects. Uh, we are now offering this chart. We want feedback. We're very interested in feedback on it to make sure that it is predictive of automotive performance and meets people's needs. In any case, we've covered several topics, and uh, I'll uh, open it for questions. Cool. Thanks very Thank much, Norman.